You know, when we're talking about higher education, when higher education talks about traditional college students, they're usually referring to in terms of age, 18 to 24 years of age. So when it comes to medical school, what do we know? Well, we know that there's a cluster of applicants that are applying to medical school right out of undergrad. And Rachel just previously mentioned and took a question about a gap year, and she's absolutely correct. More and more students are taking a gap after college. But what we also see is students taking some gap between high school and undergrad. So I've had a unique, distinct pleasure of having the opportunity to teach at every single grade level. So I've been a teacher at elementary school, middle school, high school, and undergrad when I used to work at University of Southern California. And now I get to work with post back and graduate students. So, so let's clarify and make sure we're all on the same page. Non-traditional used to be non-traditional, but that non-traditional in terms of age and life experience is, is slowly becoming the traditional, meaning that more and more applicants in the med school population um, are older. They have more experiences. Um, so today, what I wanted to really do with the limited time that we have is to help all of you rethink a paradigm shift, if you will, of how to look at med school admissions. Because I think too often, I've been doing this for about two, almost 20 years, so a long time. And what I uh, have noticed over the years is Every med student still believes that there is this sort of prototypical uh, a, you know, profile of a successful med school applicant. Uh, for those of you maybe prepping for psychology, the social section of the MCAT, you might be familiar with the concept of schemas. So using that concept, the schema of a successful med school applicant, every applicant or you know, a large portion of the applicants believe and adhere to the same schema. So I do have a PowerPoint here just to make sure I cover all the important points. So if I could get some help with the PowerPoint, I believe that that is available. Is that possible? If not, I can try to do a, a screen share. What single word best captures the med school admission process? So this is where I want every single one of you to really think about it. And if there is a chat feature, uh, unfortunately, I cannot multitask like Rachel did and, you know, do both. But certainly, uh, I think it's important for all of you to truly gain the most out of our time together is to participate. So go ahead and type that if there's a place. What single word best captures the med school admission process? All right. I'm gonna assume that there's a few responses there. If I could get some help reading off those responses, that would be great. Yes, okay, so there are some coming off on the side here. We have stressful, uh, exciting, mm -hmm. tenacity. Got it. Uh, resilience, daunting, okay. holistic. Oh. <laughs> all right, well, those are all accurate. I think those words are I've heard many, many times before. But today, again, my objective is nothing short of helping all of you really look at this process in a new way. And new doesn't always mean better, but it certainly helps because it's yet another perspective of how to look at this process, which can be daunting, stressful, right, and amazing and exciting all rolled into one. So the one word that I want you to focus on at this point is decisions. Now, the word decisions on my screen looks ginormous and it should look pretty big on your screen as well. And there's a reason for that. I don't want you to forget it. Decisions, decisions. Why would I choose the word decisions? Well, think about it, everyone. What, what must happen before you declare yourself a pre-med, right? Now you get asked all the time, so what's your major? And you know, some people might, you might say biology, some people say pre-med, I mean, but something have had to have happened for you to make that decision for your major. Something must have happened for you to decide that you're gonna pursue medicine as a future profession. So decisions is, 
just all over the process. We're talking about from your perspective as the student, you're making decisions all the time. Do I need to take these classes? Do I need to repeat classes? Um, do I do I take an MCAT prep? Do I not take an MCAT prep? It, the whole process is just riddled with decisions. And you got to understand, cognitively speaking, EdSec being my background, just trust me on this, that decision making is one of the most challenging. There's plenty of content information out on the web. There's amazing information available at the med school headquarters. I mean, I love working with Dr. Ryan Gray. He and I have known each other for many years. Uh, he's got great material on there. But what you'll find is sometimes you just want to know how to make the best decision. So let me talk a little bit more about decisions by talking about an analogy. So we're talking Amazon. Are you guys familiar with Amazon? I hope so. If you are not familiar with Amazon, I don't know where you've been for the, the last, you know, several decades. So if you are trying to buy a product, let's say a very exact product that has, you know, no variation because you know exactly what you want. So let's say an Apple um, i12, you know, 256 megabytes uh, blue in color. I mean, you know exactly all the specs of what it is you want. So you go on Amazon because that's where usually most people uh, go to first to look for the product that they want to buy. So if you type that in, how many sellers do you think you would get back if you're typing in that exact same pro that exact um, item? How, how many sellers would you say? I mean, maybe some of you are curious and you just typed it in right now and you are doing it. And that's one of the beauties of, of technology. We can do things like that. Anybody uh, get a count of how many uh, sellers are selling that exact product? You could type it in the chat. There's got to be at least a couple hundred, no? I mean, I'd be shocked if it's under 100. And by the way, all of you can see that, um, you know, time with me is always just interactive. I just, I feel that it's a better way to to take away and 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 really benefit from that time together. So go ahead and type it in and, and you could even guess. I mean, let's just use a reasonable number that we think might be, you know, very realistic. How many, how many sellers selling the exact same product on Amazon? I'm okay with silence. That's another thing, discomfort. You know, we, I can go into a whole, you know, lesson on discomfort, but is there any uh, number there? Yes, some people said hundreds. Someone said more than a hundred, probably. Someone All said right. 300 to 500. Okay. We'll say a hundred. That's a conservative estimate. Just a hundred sellers worldwide. This is global, right? Because Amazon's global. Only a hundred, you know, uh, various retailers are selling that exact product. Now, how are you going to make your decision of who to buy from? I mean, who are you going to buy from? I think one of the first line of filter is, drum roll, it's actually, it's not that much of a surprise, is price, right? I think we can all agree that for most of us, that first filter is usually price when we're looking at trying to buy something. Again, we have to assume the product is the same because if we're talking different memory, if we're talking, you know, uh, different features, then obviously you can't compare apples and oranges, but we're talking about an exact same item. So you're going to use price as a differentiator. Okay. All right. So we narrowed it down. We went from a hundred to let's say 35, 35 sellers have the lowest price, but it's all the same price, right? I don't even know how much that goes for. Let's just say, I don't know, what, what does an I-12 go for? Let's just say uh, $600, okay? So you, you got, you've you narrowed it down, you funneled it down to 35 sellers that sell it for $600. So now how are you going to decide? I mean, because you, you have to make more decisions, do you not? Right. So just in the chat, what would be the next filter that you might use to further narrow it down? Janelle Sear says reviews. Absolutely. I would agree with you, Janelle. I, I would look at reviews. Who's got five star reviews? Right. I'm going to look at reviews because that indicates to me like who's reliable, who's dependable, who, you know, who's trustworthy to do business with. 
So 35 and you filtered it by reviews. So guess what? You've narrowed it down to about 15 now. 15 have four and a half stars or better because nobody has five star review. So now you've narrowed it down to 15 with four and a half stars. Still pretty impressive, right? But guess what? There's still 15. You, unless you're going to buy 15 iPhones, which I think we can all agree is not, is not realistic. You just want to buy one phone. So now what's the next line of filter that you guys want to use? Because I guarantee you we're all thinking of one. We all will use one to further narrow down that pool of 15. Okay. Someone said ratings, shipping speed, free shipping. Yeah, absolutely. Because remember, some places will charge you for the shipping, whereas other places, shipping's included. Okay. Very good. Okay. You guys can see where we're going. 15. It pairs it down to 10 now. You got 10 sellers. Free shipping, shipping, cost of shipping is included. They all have four and a half stars uh, rating, okay? They all have the same low price, but it's the same price. So now you're, you know, you're down to 10. Now, how, what, what's another filter, right? What's another one? Prime. Prime, okay? Maybe they do participate in Prime and you can group, you know, shipping. All of this to say, not every single one of you are going to look at the prime, right? Because I guarantee you, some of you were thinking, you know, using your scientific mind, I'm going to look at the sample size, not just the four and a half stars, because let's face it, some sellers have a four and a half star, but that's because they got eight reviews and probably seven of those are family members and friends. So you're going to look at the sample size to help you differentiate. Some of you might look at where is it being sold or shipped? Because if it's close to you, it will get to you faster. If they're on, you know, in another country, oh my goodness, international, you got to go through customs and inspection and it takes much longer. And, you know, God forbid they send it by, by, by ship, like, you know, um, not airmail. It, it might take a month or so. So again, all of this to really help drive home and allow you to think not from your own perspective, but from the medical school's perspective. Because it's very similar to what we just spent the last few minutes talking about. Med schools, newsflash, you guys, be, you guys ready? Med schools receive more applications than they have spots available, right? That's, that's not, you know, that shouldn't shock you. I mean, that's very rhetorical, actually. Um, so what do we know? They get so many applications, they need to make decisions. Do they not? I mean, they need to make decisions. So when they receive, let's say, you know, I think uh, David Geffen received something close to 10,000 applications. They get about 175, 180 seats. So how do they make that decision? Now, some of you might be thinking GPA, MCAT. Well, they certainly use those factors. They use those variables. But guess what? That, that is not the only variables because we don't have to think, think too far back as far as like high school, when, you know, everyone's done this, um, that time of the year where you get the envelopes, small or big, people are talking, although this, these days you guys probably get email uh, of your admission outcome, then everyone starts talking, you know, hey, did you hear this person got in here, this person got rejected there, you're all comparing notes and trying to figure out, well, that person had a higher SAT score, a lower GPA, but why did they get it? You're trying to look for some logical, rational system by which admission process works. And these days, all of you have probably heard holistic review, right? I'm pretty sure all of you have heard. And if not, holistic review is just that. It means looking at the whole picture, the entirety of a person's candidacy. When you hear holistic review, though, it means they do consider everything. It does not mean they neglect parts of your application, because oftentimes, the students I work with will say, well, they don't do holistic review because they just eliminated me from my low G because of my low GPA. So again, really setting your mind to think in that way that they got to make these decisions. So let's move on. How are decisions made? Okay. We know that decisions are critical now. I think I, I presented the case that decisions are extremely important. So how are decisions made or as the slide here says, decisions are based on what? 
feelings? I mean, go ahead, type it in, you guys, in the chat. Decis how are decisions made? I know, is, I know this is not going to be on the MCAT, but I assure you, this is good stuff. Any responses? Not yet. Okay. It's a tough question. And for the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and share it with you. Decisions are based on, drum roll, because this one I think is not so obvious, differences, differentiation. And I know that with that single word, I might have triggered some of your PTSD from calculus. Um, differentiation is not just for calculus. It is for making decisions. Our brains rely on differences to make decisions. The whole Amazon um, analogy should have clearly conveyed to you that our brain uses those differences to make those decisions. So remember, these differences are important, but let's also be clear. Different, just for the sake of being different, uh, doesn't serve a purpose. It has no benefits, right? It needs to be a genuine, authentic difference. So again, earlier, Rachel talked about gap year. If you are thinking about doing a gap year just because I heard, you know, gap year is the cool thing. It's the trend. Uh, you're in for a surprise. It It, it is definitely a, a you know trend that has been picking up steam. But in terms of differentiating, it might not achieve that purpose. Now, of course, it depends. What are you going to do during that gap year? Oftentimes, these questions, um, you got to dive deeper, you guys. The question of should I take a gap year or not? Right. I mean, think about that. Critically think. I know we hear that concept all the time. Critically think. What does that mean? It means you got to slow down and really think things through from all different angles and perspectives. So when you say taking a gap year, well, if you're going to take that gap year to just hang out at the beach and work on your tan, I think it's safe to say taking a gap year is a horrible idea. But what are you going to do during that that gap year or years? OK, so decisions are based on differences. So here's a way to look at the application process. There are two basic objectives. Number one, these med school people, they want to know, are you academically ready? OK, because they don't want to take an, a risk on someone who's going to struggle and drop out. And from the student's perspective, I know that from your perspective, not getting into med school seems like the worst thing. It, it is horrible. I applied. I didn't get in. It does seem like it, it's it's a, a reason to, to be disappointed, to be sad, which I would agree. But here's the deal. You know what's worse than not getting into med school? It's getting into med school and then dropping out. And unfortunately, throughout my career, I have worked with some students who did go on to med school. They were excited, but they struggled. They weren't ready. And so they had to drop out. And I believe about half of them went back to finish, but the other half pursued other interests. So academic readiness, that is something that clearly needs to be captured in your application. And we'll break it down even further. But for right now, I want you to know the other objective, which is commitment to the profession. Because let's face it, you could be absolutely academically a monster, a beast, you got 4.0, you have perfect, you know, MCAT score. But are you committed to the profession? Because the med school admission folks are going to be weary. They, they don't want students to be admitted into their program. And then, I don't know, a year, two years later, they they come to, you know, the admission office and say, you know, I've discovered myself and I realize my passion is advocating for patients in medically underserved communities. So I decided to pursue law. So I'm going to go into to law school. And so they leave med school. That is a big concern for medical school. So really, if you want to simplify this entire application process, look at it through the lens of academic readiness and commitment to the profession. Now, we're talking about non-traditional, traditional here. So what can we what are some generalizations? Right. We, we can't you know, claim perfect uh, applicability for the entire population. But what are some generalities that we can, you know, comfortably uh, deem accurate? Academic readiness, probably not a whole lot of direct causation, right, in terms of age. Um, 
just because you're older doesn't mean you're less academic re ready, or if you're younger, you're more academically ready or vice versa. But we know that there are some correlations in terms of, you know, being younger and less life experience, you might make some mistakes during, especially your freshman year. I know I speak from my own first year experience of undergrad, that that transition from high school to undergrad was brutal. I mean, no matter how many APs and you know honors classes taken in high school, that transition to undergrad was a rough one. So academic readiness, again, will vary, but we're gonna talk about how med school admission people will try to answer or evaluate an applicant's academic readiness. And then of course, commitment to the profession, kind of like what Rachel mentioned earlier. If you've done something for just six months, compare that to a non-traditional applicant, they might have more experience, longer commitment to volunteer opportunities and so forth. So uh, look at the admission process through these two sort of objectives. So here's a snapshot of all applicants. Every single applicant who applies to med school will have these items, okay? Now, we don't know sort of to the degree or a, um, a quantitative variation, obviously we'll talk about that, but in terms of will they have these items, yes. Um, so what we're gonna start off with, and I've color coded this. If you go back, academic readiness is blue, commitment to the profession is red. Just keep that in mind because um, I have it corresponding with that objective. So uh, what are the items that med school admission committees will use to gauge the academic readiness? GPA, that's not a surprise. You know, GPA gives the admission committee members confidence that an applicant is ready for the rigors of med school curriculum. Lower the GPA, the more nervous and you know uh, risk taking it is for them to do so. Uh, second, we have MCAT. MCAT scores. Now we could talk about well, standardized tests are biased. You know they they do not accurately measure. We we can claim all that, but the reality is, it is being used current. I have to say currently because those of you that are following know that the USMLE the boards went from you know a numerical score to a pass no pass. So. Um, that'll make differentiation more challenging for them because, again, all of these are very comfortable tools that admission committee members use to differentiate applicants because here are the differences. You got this person with a 3.9. You got this applicant with a 3.4. So when there is a difference, it makes the decisions easier. Now, are we going to say that admission is all about the GPA and the MCAT? Of course not. We already know that is not true. In fact, I have done a fun exercise with my post back students where I've asked them, you know, here's a list of all the former students I have worked with. Try to guess what their outcome was. Uh, did they get into MD? Did they go on to DO? Or did they not get into neither? And the pieces of data that they were given was the science GPA, the overall GPA, and their MCAT score, the best MCAT score. And so, they needed to, um, I believe it was about 50, 50 cases that they were trying to predict, um, you know, what was the outcome? So those of us that are more comfortable with statistics, you got one out of three, right? So a third of the 50, you should get right based purely on chance. Well, it turns out they did far worse than chance. Uh, many of them thought because they had a higher MCAT score, let's say, that they probably ended up MD, if they had a lower GPA and lower uh, MCAT, they probably ended up in neither. I mean, there are these sort of heuristics that I think my students use to try to predict the outcome. So again, GPA, MCAT, they're important. They address the academic readiness. But again, when you start talking about a 3.83, 3.87, 3.91, I mean, you know, that, that graph of the uh, impact, uh, the, the weight of that variable, it starts to asymptote. So, you know, whether you have a 395 or a 392, it really doesn't make a difference because in the minds of the committee members, you are academically ready. And of course, again, th these are not viewed in isolation. They are viewed in the whole application. And so we move on to the other parts of the application. Clinical experience. Now this one is red because remember from the previous slide, we got academic readiness and then commitment to the profession. 
your clinical experience is critical. I have yet in my 20 years of experience worked with a student who applied to med school and got an acceptance who had no clinical experience. I think we can all agree that that is absolutely you know, true. So make sure that all of you have clinical experience. So snapshot of all applicants, everyone's gonna have GPA, MCAT, clinical experience, volunteer, right? I mean, I, I can't, I mean, I can't think of an applicant I've worked with where they had zero volunteer experience. Okay, moving on. Now, scribe EMT, that one I should have put an asterisk because not everyone's done it. But um, again, having been in this space for as long as I have, you know, scribing didn't even exist, you know, 20, 20 years ago. EMT was around, but again, it's sort of, it's almost like fashion trends. You know, it, it's like these trends where people hear, oh, you know, I heard this person did EMT and it just gains popularity. It becomes the trendy thing to do, EMT. Another one that I don't have here that's become very, very popular is international medical missions trip. You guys know what I'm talking about. Central America, everybody's got to go to Central America. Um, of course, the Central America, the, the country might vary from applicant to ap applicant, but it very much is the same sort of checklist. So moving on, I put research experience here. It's, it's purple. And where do I get the purple color from? It's sort of a mixture of the red and blue. Uh, some committee members will look upon research as an indication, as a proxy for academic readiness. And others might just see it as, no, you were just basically a lab assistant. So that one is kind of tricky. So it's really, really important that when you talk about and communicate your research experience that you do so in a, in a very uh, detailed way. Uh, publication, again, that may or may not go towards readiness. You got reference letters. Everyone's going to have reference letters. And then, of course, everyone's going to have personal statement. So um, post back programs, um, again, if you're a non-traditional student, meaning that that definition could also apply to not just age, but your decision to pursue medicine. Maybe you, you've come late to that realization that you want to pursue medicine. You know, you, you have students who uh, thought one major, one career, and then they change and pivot towards medicine. So what you will need to do is you need that basic science foundation. So biology, chemistry, ochem, physics, mathematics, statistics. So there's some very basic minimum uh, coursework that you need to do. Now you can do that on your own. That's why I have here, do it yourself. Or you can go through a post -back program. And post -back programs have the added advantage of academic advising. You have someone that you can go to for just uh, questions and answers. And also like we've been talking about, help with making decisions. Uh, Co-curricular activities. Some programs have an MCAT prep kind of built in. They do some interview prep. I mean, there's a lot of other sort of uh, peripheral support that goes in with the postback program. And then, of course, support with the application. You'll get you'll get letters. Some places will advertise that all of their postback students will get a letter. Uh, you'll get obviously feedback on on all aspects of your candidacy. They might even help you with choosing which program to apply to. Like Rachel gave you an excellent advice about looking at the school's mission. So some states by law cannot or are very, very frowned upon to take out-of-state students. So here are all the advantages of doing a post -back program. But here we know that everything in life has disadvantages. So what's a disadvantage of post -back program? Is the cost. post -back programs can be very expensive. So you can do all your homework online and see what the costs are. But those are some of the highlights of doing the post -back route. Um, let me go back and talk also about DIY. DIY, you can do that, right? There's a lot of information out on the web. Community colleges, state schools, extension, right? A lot of the UCs, for those of you in California, uh, UCs have extension programs where you can take classes and they're far, far cheaper than going through a post -back program. So uh, you can do it yourself. You can go through a formal program. But the important thing is going back to what we talked about from the very beginning. How are you going to differentiate yourself and address those two objectives that med school admission committees are looking to answer? Are you academically ready? Meaning, will you be successful? And then also, are you truly committed to this profession of becoming a physician? Uh, and if you are basically, you know, writing your personal statement, as many, many applicants do, it follows sort of almost a Hollywood script. I mean, it's it, since I was five years old, I can't imagine being doing anything else and so forth. I mean, while that may be true, 
and that captures your experience, it doesn't help the committee members make decisions because as we've been talking all along, decisions need differences. And so again, you don't have to do some novel thing like I volunteered on a hot air balloon, you know, helping a surgery take place, you know, 20,000 feet above ground. You don't need some outrageous thing like that. Novelty is not it. I mean, I think students confuse novelty with being unique. But it is, um, it is the best way I could explain is this way, and, and I'll take questions. The best way to explain it is all of you guys are pretty much using the same ingredients. If we're going to transition to a culinary analogy, all of you guys can have the exact same ingredients, but all of you will produce your own dishes. It'll, it'll be different. There will be variations. So focus on thinking about it in those terms. Don't get so fixated on, I need organic grass-fed beef. I need to have all the freshest ingredients. I mean, yeah, that, that, that could help, but let's face it. Having watched enough cooking shows with my family, you could have the best ingredients and the outcome is horrible. You burn something or, you know, you put too much of a seasoning. So it's not so much the ingredients, but it truly is how to capture everything together. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and take some questions. I'm sure, I hope there's some questions or I'm just going to interpret that as I did such a great job. I answered all the questions and there's no questions left. So let me go ahead and stop sharing here. Okay, we have some questions in the chat. If you do have questions, go ahead and post them. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Okay, first question here. Does the volunteer experience have to be medical related? For example, I volunteer with a couple different cultural and human rights organization. Is that also acceptable? Not only is it acceptable, it's a beautiful differentiator. I mean, when you look at the volunteer experiences, so here, here's where, again, just because you volunteer or just because you do kind things doesn't make you a kind person. Just because you volunteer doesn't make you an altruistic person because imagine an applicant who has nothing but medically related volunteer experiences. How will the reviewers know the motive behind why they volunteered in a medical? Is it truly because that's what they enjoy? Could be, right? It could be, but it could also be because they're thinking, okay, that's what we're looking for. They, they want to clearly show that medicine is their thing. But I would argue you want to have non-medical clinical. In fact, that's why that option exists in AMCAS and ACOMAS. I mean, you can put non-medical clinical related volunteer experiences, and those are really, really nice because it also reveals about who you are, does it not? I mean, if you're interested in those special you know, causes, that's wonderful because now you are doing what these applications uh, were meant to do, which is to help the med school admission committee members get to know who you are, not what you just did, right? I talk about that quite a bit. It's not about what you did. I did this, I did that. Well, that, that's great that you did those things, but the real undergirding sort of question that really drives these admission committee members is to try to figure out who the heck are you, right? I mean, that's great you did those things, but who are you? And that, that you have to understand that concept. But again, you know, really, you know, you have to shift the way you think about this process. I mean, just because you think that, well, this person got in because of these things, therefore I need to do that. Like, for example, one of the things that I hear all the time is research experience. Oh, I don't have research experience. So I need to get research experience. Really? I mean, that, that would be equivalent to someone who's, I don't know, trying to find a significant other, you know, in a long-term relationship and say, you know, no, no one's going out with me, but you know what? My friend, he rides a motorcycle. So you know what? I'm going to go get a hog and I'm going to get a motorcycle and then someone's going to go out with me. I mean, what kind of way of, of thinking is that? But that happens all the time. We'll have students say, well, you know, this person did this extracurricular. So therefore, I got to do that extracurricular. No, what you really want to do is capture who you are, because here's the reality, everyone. You don't have to try to be different. Right. Just think about it. You know, with with how many, you know, I think it's around seven billion people on this planet. No two are exactly alike. Yet when you look at the pre-med population, you got a lot of people who look just like each other. You got comparable GPAs, comparable MCAT. You guys went to, I mean, if you're a California student, everybody went to a UC or CSU. I mean, it's just really hard to differentiate because they're, they're, the applicant's pool looks so similar. 
Okay. Great question. Next question. Next question is, as a career changer, do medical schools look down on taking the prereqs at a community college? Uh, in public, in a public domain, they would say no. But behind closed doors, I, I know for a fact that they do. They, you know, especially sort of the old school admission committee members, they, they look upon it as not as rigorous. But you also have to understand, I think, uh, sort of the the younger and uh, more recent admission committee members who are younger, um, they know to, to be more um, critical in the way they assess that, that first question of academic readiness. Because think about it this way. If your community college grades are all vowels and then you transfer to a four-year institution and then you get a bunch of Bs and Cs, no As, that is concerning, is it not? In fact, I saw that a lot. You know, I did my undergrad at UCLA, go Bruins in the house. You know, I saw a lot of students who were extremely successful during um, community college, and then they transferred to UCLA and they, they really struggled. And so that does raise some concern for the admission committee members, but this is where they also get to look at if there's any additional coursework. So if you are a non traditional applicant, you probably have had some additional courses completed after you graduated from undergrad. So they'll look at those grades. And again, they'll look at those grades to try to gauge, are you a, a stock that's turning and, and on the up and up? Or are you just still academic risk? And the other thing that they can do, very, very likely they will do, is they will look at your MCAT score and compare it with alongside your GPA. Because if you have low MCAT scores, you have high community college grades, but low you know, four year institution that will raise some yellow flags for, you know, some committee members. Um, but if you have A's in community college, you have A's and B's in your four year institution, you have a pretty, you know, respectable MCAT score, then there's no reason to worry. But there is a bias, right? I mean, we, we all have biases. You know, I mean, we can get into another whole session on the biases between MDs and DOs and that whole uh, conversation. So uh, thank you for that question. So it really depends. Uh, we cannot generalize and say, you know, don't take classes at community colleges, take it at Harvard. You know, I, I've had, I used to, when I used to work at USC, um, I had some students who took their summer classes at Harvard. And I would ask them, why'd you do that? Well, they made an assumption that if you take it at a good school, that somehow you're gonna get, uh, you know, extra points for that. No, high school is over. You gotta leave high school behind. No more extra points for honors and AP classes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. As a non-traditional student with a family and who works full time, schools understand that I may not have the quantity of clinical or volunteer hours that other students have. Fantastic question, Jordan. So I have worked with students with family, uh, married, married, um, you know, and, and a lot of students these days have dogs and pets, which is kind of like being responsible for a, another life. So absolutely, they will take that into consideration. But the way you need to think about it is this way. They understand you have these other obliga obligations and responsibilities, but if they, they have to try to answer the question of, you know, with all of those other competing responsibilities, can you still be successful in their medical school? That's the way they're going to be interpreting your, uh, your candidacy. Because if you can demonstrate that, yes, you have these, you know, uh, all these other forces pulling you in different directions, but that you're still able to perform at a level that is going to be, you know, helping you get through med school and graduate, then they're going to they're gonna be fine. In fact, I love working with non-traditional students because they have a lot more differentiators, right? I mean, we've been talking about decisions and differences. And so absolutely. Um, but med school admission committees will not take a risk if you convey throughout your application that your family needs you, you are the primary, you know, income source. And it really conveys this integral uh, role that you play and and it really conflicts with your ability to devote yourself to a full-time medical school you know uh, commitment they are going to be weary right I mean it just only makes sense that they don't want to set up people for failure so they're going to do their due diligence to try to gauge whether someone who is non-traditional with all these other uh, co commitments and responsibilities can they still, uh, be able to do well in medical school. It's the same thing, very similar when I get questions about mental health. You know, students will ask, should I disclose it? Should I not? 
you know, students will say, I, I will disclose it if it helps me get in, but I will keep it a secret if, if I don't, if it's going to be used against me. Again, it has to do with being true and authentic to yourself and thinking, will they feel comfortable? Will they have confidence that I will still be successful despite all of that? You know, if you are dealing with uh, mental health uh, issues, how are you coping with that? So uh, excellent question. And again, you'll start to, you know, see that the process is pretty transparent, um, as Rachel mentioned earlier, uh, but it can feel daunting and it, and it really requires persistence. So kudos to all of you. It's, it's a pretty tough road. It's a road that I thought I wanted to go down many, many years ago. And then I discovered the love for education and teaching and mentoring. So any other questions here? I believe we are all out of time for questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. What, what a what a fun time I've had. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Giovanni and Rachel and, and Leanne and Ryan Gray, Dr. Ryan Gray. Thank you so much to all of you for having me. Um, I love, uh, this is, this is my passion. You know, students talk about passion to help people. Um, I love to help people who help people. So uh, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day at the conference. This is an amazing event uh, and have a wonderful three-day weekend.